So before we continue, I want to explain very quickly about a hadith. What is a hadith? Basically, there's two types of hadith. There are hadith that are acceptable, maqbool, and then hadith that are mardud, that are rejected. Basically, a hadith describes the, um, the actions the, or gives the speech or the tacit approvals of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The af'al, the um, aqwal, and the taqarir. Um, so, so there's a difference now between hadith and sunnah, right? Um, obviously, there's overlap. We, 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 uh, we draw or extract the sunnah from the hadith, um, but they're not necessarily the same things. There's a lot of hadith. There's thousands upon thousands of hadith at different grades. We'll talk briefly about that. Anything that is attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, peace and blessings of God be upon him, is considered to be a hadith. Uh, but the sunnah of the Prophet, right, uh, this is what has the sort of provid providential protection, the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, this is the, the authoritative uh, or normative ethos, um, the authenticated practice of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi and the function of the sunnah, as the scholars of Islam say, al-ulama, as sunnah to tufassirul Qur'an. That the sunnah, really what it does is that it exegetes, if you will, or it explains the Qur'an, right? So the Qur'an itself says in Surah to, uh, Nahal, Surah number 16, verse 44, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed we sent down this dhikr upon you, this reminder upon you, speaking directly to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ In order for you to make bayan, in order for you to make clear, right, to explicate, to elucidate, to commentate upon what was revealed to them, to, um, to, to uh, interpret the Qur'an, the revelation of God. This is uh, one, of the, um, one of the functions of, of prophecy. So just because you read something in a hadith doesn't necessarily mean it's true, even if it's considered to be in a, a sound book of hadith. There are a lot of problems with, with hadith that are graded as sound. There's difference of opinion about them. You might read something that is sound, uh, and try to implement it, but implement it incorrectly. For example, one of my teachers years ago, he quoted a hadith that the Prophet used to eat dates, uh, but what's the proper way of eating a date? What's the proper etiquette? You pop it in your mouth and you spit out the seed. How did the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how did he eat a date? Right? He would put it into his mouth with his right hand, and then he would extract the seed, by turning his left hand over with these two fingers and push the seed out with his tongue, but no one actually saw his tongue, and then he'd discard or he would get rid of uh, the seed. So he did it in a way where there's, um, there's um, a lot of honor, um, and there wasn't, there, there's no question about having you know, bad adab or, or having bad comportment while, while, while eating. Uh, how, how does a Muslim pray? I mean, the Quran tells us to pray, but how do we pray? Can you pray any way you want to? Can you just kind of follow what your neighbor is doing or what Christians and Jews are doing? Is that how we pray? So the sunnah becomes absolutely indispensable um, in uh, understanding uh, the Quran. How do we send benedictions upon the Prophet? Uh, the Quran says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. O you who believe, right, send benedictions of peace upon the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. How do we do that? We have to look at the sunnah or the authenticated hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And it's a meticulous science. We don't have to go into it now. It's a separate class. But basically for a, a hadith to be sound, Right? The, there's, there's a sanad, which is the chain of transmission. It has to be mutasil. It has to be linked. There has to be a link, no missing, uh, no gaps in the link of transmission. Um, the famous hadith of mercy has 23 or 24 uh, um, links in its chain of transmission. This is the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
is reported to have said, and you'll find it in Musnad Ahmad, Al Rahimun, Yarhamu Humur Rahman, Irhamu Manfil Ard, Yarham Kumman Fis Sama, or Yar uh Yarhamu Kumman Fis Sama, O Kamaqala Alihi Salatu was salam, that the most compassionate shows compassion to those who show compassion. Show compassion to those on earth, and the one in heaven, in no anthropomorphic sense, will show you compassion. This hadith is called Hadith al Rahmah. There's, like I said, about two dozen or so links in its chain of transmission. Uh, and it is uh, indisputable, the words of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and this is actually the first hadith that Muslim children in the traditional Muslim world were taught. This would sort of set the foundation for their education about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, stressing the importance of compassion, the, the importance of, of mercy. So the chain of transi transmission is mutasil, there's no gaps, everyone in the chain has adala, there's, there's, they have probity, they're known as being righteous people, they have tam adapt, they have intelligence, they have good memories, there's no hidden uh, problems, no hidden illa, right? Um, which could be anything from like bad grammar, because the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not use bad or incorrect grammar. He was the most eloquent uh, of speakers. <clears throat> So, so this is a very meticulous science, the, the science of hadith authentication. And this is different than sirah, right? With sirah, you have to be careful. A lot of things get into sirah that have no chain of transmission. Um, so it's up to the ulama to go through and sort of sift through uh, the sirah and extract what is authentic to what is not. Uh, writers of sirah tend to exaggerate uh, certain things. And it's interesting because the sirah <clears throat> is uh, something that is constantly under attack uh, by, for example, Christian apologists, Christian missionaries. They tend to attack stories in Sira, and many of these stories uh, are exaggerations, um, even according to Muslim scholars. Some of these stories have, like I said, no chain of transmission, and no Muslim really takes them seriously. But these are the things that are brought up by missionaries, for example, so b basically tearing down a straw man. The example that I give, uh, the, the, the equivalent of, of that is, for example, if I said something like, if I went to a Christian and I said, you know, why did Jesus murder one of his teachers? Now, of course, I don't believe this at all. Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, is a great prophet of God in the Islamic tradition. But just to make a point here, um, and he says, well, what are you talking about? I said, no, it, no it's, that's, it's what it says. And, in, uh, in the infancy gospel of Thomas. Well, he would say, well, the infancy gospel of Thomas is, is an apocryphal gospel. We don't believe in that. That's what he would say, right? We believe in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? I say, exactly, we don't believe in that. So many of these stories in Sirah um, are just, they're, they're falsified stories. No Muslim takes them seriously. There's no chain of transmission, and they have nothing to do with our faith. But this hadith, Hadith Gabriel, right? this is considered to be a sound hadith. It's recorded by Imam Muslim. <clears throat> it is a very famous hadith, uh, as I said. So the hadith begins, an Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the hadith is on the authority of one of the greatest companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, whose name was Umar. And Umar uh, was the second caliph um, in uh, Islam following uh, the first caliph, Abu Bakr, one of the most beloved human beings uh, to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And generally, um, well, the, 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 Sun, the Sunni uh, tradition of Islam uh, uh, praise and love uh, uh, all of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. They weren't all perfect, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a respect there, uh, and that's in contrast to the Shia um, that don't respect uh, a great number or a majority of the companions uh, of the Prophet. So these are the two sort of major divisions in our tradition, Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. And, the, and really, the, I would say the differences, as far as theology goes, are minor, they're neg negligible. Some would disagree with that. Uh, but the vast majority of scholars on both sides do not anathematize either side. They don't make takfir. Right, um, but the major difference is really in probably um, political theory, political theology. <clears throat>
Uh, but nonetheless, <clears throat> the hadith begins by saying, بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ جُرُوسٌ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. So Sayyidina Umar is saying that one day we were sitting with the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. And the title of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم here in Arabic, Rasulullah, a construct phrase, the Messenger of God. Rasul is equivalent probably to the Greek Apostle, which literally means one who is sent forth. And of course, the word for God in Arabic is Allah, and this is um, uh, the, the name of God in Arabic. But, there, but in, in all Semitic languages, the, the word for God begins with the Alif and the Lam, or Alif and Lamid. Um, so in, uh, in Hebrew, you have Elo um, uh, as the singular, and Elohim, which is the plural of majesty, which we find many, many times in the Hebrew Bible. In Aramaic or Syriac, you have Allah, right? <clears throat> so Jesus, peace be upon him, Isa alayhi salam, he would have used um, Allah because he spoke uh, Aramaic or, or Syriac. So for example, in Mark 1.15, uh, the, behold the kingdom of God, the Malkutha da Allah is at hand. So Jesus would have used this name for God, Allah. Um, so the Quran, uh, so in Arabic uses that name as well. So he's saying, we, we're sitting with the messenger of a God, peace be upon him, that a yeoman one day, and behold, a man rose among us, right? So the Arabic here suggests that he sort of just uh, seemingly appeared out of nowhere. Shadidu bayad thiyab, he was wearing exceedingly white clothes. Shadidu sawad sha'ar, he had exceedingly black hair. لا يرى عليه أثر السفر. The traces of travel was not seen on him. So, uh, you know, he didn't have, he wasn't dusty, he wasn't disheveled, anything like that. He didn't look like a traveler, didn't have, you know, a bag or something with him. ولا يعرفه من أحد. And none of us knew who he was. Or none of us recognized him. Right? So, this is uh, obviously the archangel Gabriel, right? Jibril alayhi salam. Jibril in Arabic, Gavriel in Hebrew, which means the power of God. <clears throat> and Gabriel would often uh, incarnate, that is to say, assume human flesh in order to teach human beings, right? Uh, so this is one of the ways in which the prophets would, uh, would interact with angels, that the angels would take human form. It's called incarnation. Muslims do not believe that God incarnates, right? So this is a major difference of opinion uh, between a major difference in theology, let's say between Hinduism and Islam or Christianity in Islam and Christian. So in Hinduism, there are countless incarnations of God. Uh, is, is Hinduism essentially a monotheistic religion? That's an interesting question that we can talk about later. In Christianity, God did not incarnate except for once, and that was in the person of Christ, according to Christians, and we'll talk about uh, that as well. So oftentimes, Gabriel would incarnate, and he would teach the Prophet. He's the teacher of the Prophet, although Muslims believe that the Prophet Muhammad's rank is higher than Gabriel. His rank is actually higher than his teacher, because the Prophet is the best of creation. He is the beloved of God. Right? So it's not, it's not all about knowledge. Right? Um, you can have teachers that are, uh, that are arrogant. You have students that surpass their teachers over time uh, in piety and even in knowledge. It's very, very common. So, so Gabriel would come to the prophet. He would teach him uh, the religion, or he would bring the prophet Quran. He would bring the prophet revelation. Oftentimes, Gabriel, in, in human form, would simply tell the prophet to repeat after him. And the prophet would repeat, and that's called an exterior locution. Other times, the angel would come to the prophet, but was not seen by him. And the angel would uh, dictate to the prophet internally. The prophet would, uh, he would perceive words internally sounds forming words or vibrations forming words. 
and he would perceive that and then he would just repeat that and that's called an interior locution so the Quran would come to the Prophet in both ways and on rare occasion the Quran would come to the Prophet without any angelic uh, mediation right so interior locution without angelic mediation and our scholars like Imam Suyuti and others uh, scholars of Ulum al-Qur'an or the sciences um, or I'm using the word science and sort of the pre-1800 like disciplines of the Qur'an they would say that uh, for example the the last two ayahs of al-Baqarah uh, were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by God glorified and exalted as he through interior locution without angelic mediation and they mention others too well, duha wa layli idha saja, Surah 93, and the Surah that follows it, alam nashrah laka sadarak, wallahu alam. So here we have Gabriel, peace be upon him, the great archangel. He's taken on human form. He's wearing white clothes, very white clothes. He has exceedingly black hair, and no one recognizes him. So he comes and Sayyidina Umar, he continues, he says, hatta jalasa ilan nabi so that he sits right in front of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Um, to the point where he sort of touches or links his knees against his. So he's sitting right in front of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And then Gabriel puts his hands on his thighs, on his own thighs, and he's listening intently. Um, uh, to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him so here Gabriel appears to be teaching us proper adab sort of proper etiquette or comportment uh, with the Prophet and this is very important um, for Muslims that we show proper respect towards all the prophets of God right and of course the Quran mentions about 25 of them but the hadith uh, indicates that there are thousands of prophets 25 mentioned in the Quran and all of them are respected and loved by Muslims right so these include uh, even Adam alayhi salam the Adam is considered a prophet in Islam um, Noah is considered a prophet in Islam uh, Moses peace be upon him um, and uh, uh, before that Ibrahim alayhi salam and or Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac both of them considered prophets in the Islamic tradition both of them beloved by Muslims both of them respected both of them considered legitimate prophets and, and, and righteous uh, even Jacob is considered a prophet in Islam so uh, these stories that are mentioned about for example Jacob in the book of Genesis where he's really depicted uh, in a very negative way, right? Basically, as this kind of trickster, um, uh, and that's a kind of common sort of uh, literary device or uh, um, uh, literary character in ancient literature. That there's this trickster, trickster figure who is is considered to be um, very clever and gets his way by by obviously um, tricking people and. This is sort of praised in, in, in the book of Genesis, that God has this type of unconditional love uh, for Jacob, despite all of his faults. So things like that, Muslims will not um, confirm. So the dominant opinion, and we'll talk more about this as well, is that um, when the Quran speaks of the Torah that was revealed to Moses, peace be upon him, it's not talking about what is today considered the Torah. Right, because clearly there, there are stories in the so-called Torah of today that are uh, unacceptable from a theological standpoint, from an Islamic theological standpoint. There are many things in the Torah that we would consider to be uh, accurate uh, uh, and even true, but at the end of the day, uh, Muslims don't rely on any other scriptures. All of these scriptures from the perspective of the Quran and Islam have been abrogated. Islam has its own scripture. It is the Quran. Islam has its own sacred law, which is derived from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him. <clears throat> so anyway, um, 
we were talking about proper comportment with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, the Imam of Medina in the second century, the second half of the second century, uh, or right in the middle of the second century after Hijrah was Imam Malik ibn Anas, uh, who died, I believe, 179 Hijri. Uh, students would come to him and they would study fiqh, they would study jurisprudence, and they would study hadith. And when they would study fiqh, he would immediately begin teaching them. But if they wanted to study hadith, he would prepare himself. Oftentimes he would go and he would take a shower, he would wear white clothes, he would tie his turban, he would burn some incense, right? put on some musk. Why would he do that? Is because he's going to teach the words of the Master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So out of respect for the words of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Mubarak mentions something interesting. He mentions that uh, one time Imam Malik ibn Anas, as we said, the Imam of Medina to Munawwara, he was teaching his famous hadith book, al muwatta And uh, as, he was, as he was relating a hadith of the Messenger of God, uh, peace be upon him, they noticed that he, he, would, he would cringe and his face would turn pale. And this would happen over and over again, but he wouldn't stop the hadith of the Prophet. So, um, after he was done with the hadith, he told his students, look between my shirt and my back, and they saw that a scorpion had lashed him something like 14, 15, or 16 times. But he didn't want to cut off the speech of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him. So he continued uh, with the hadith. So Gabriel, he sits in front of the Prophet, peace be upon him, sort of locking his knees and listening intently. And then he says, however, Ya Muhammad. So he, he calls to the Prophet, peace be upon him, by using his, his first name, right? And this was something that is prohibited to do. The companions uh, did not do that, right? They used the title of the Prophet. Even God in the Quran does not address the Prophet وسلم, directly uh, by using his uh, first name. He speaks about the Prophet by using his name. Um, in the third person, right? Muhammadur Rasulullah, for example. Wa ma Muhammadun illa Rasul, for example. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking directly to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a title. Ya ayyuhar Rasul, ya ayyuhan Nabiyu. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do that? It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam how to address the Prophet. So here, however, Gabriel is saying, Ya Muhammad. So the ulama say here that Gabriel is posing as a Bedouin to conceal his identity because the Bedouin were a bit uh, gruff. They were a bit rough around the edges. Or the ulama say that this prohibition uh, is not for the angels, but only for um, the, the human believers in the Prophet, peace be upon him. So in that sense, then Gabriel is actually sort of subtly revealing his identity. Nonetheless, he says, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni an al-Islam. Tell me about al-Islam. Of course, this is the name of the religion. But in this hadith, according to the scholars of hadith, this seems to be uh, a reference to the sort of exoteric or exterior aspect of the religion, what sometimes philosophers of religion call the sort of lateral or horizontal aspect of the religion. Of course, it means submission, submission unto God. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, And then the Prophet responded to Gabriel by saying, الْإِسْلَامُ أَنْ تَشْهَدَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Right? So Islam is to witness or to testify that there is no ilah, there is no deity, there is no God, except Allah except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's no ilah. Nothing deserves worship other than Allah. Nothing deserves worship. Nothing other than God has divine attributes. Nothing other than God has the intrinsic ability to help and or harm you. So this is what is testified on the tongue. Right, so this is the first pillar of Islam, uh, Islam, and tashhada, shahada, 
to testify and is done upon the tongue la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah this is when this is this is uh, 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 when a a convert wants to become muslim a proselyte becomes muslim they will utter the shih the shahada they will say ashhadu i witness i testify and la ilaha illallah there's no ilah there's no deity there's no divinity there's no other person that has divine attributes that deserves or merits worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah and i bear witness that there's uh, and i bear witness that the, the prophet muhammad peace be upon him is the messenger of god so the prophet himself this is what he says here al islam number 1 and tashhada an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadar rasulullah is to testify that there is no deity other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the messenger of God so one of my teachers he said here this is this is an, something uh, interesting la ilaha right that's atheism there is no god illallah except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or except God capital G so we're moving from atheism into deism now that there is a god and that this god um, is the sort of great architect of the universe the creator of all things wa anna muhammadar rasulullah and now we move into theism so from atheism to deism to theism so deism god is just impersonal right but when we say muhammadur rasulullah and muhammad is a messenger of god this reveals the personal aspect of god how does it do that well it's it shows or it is it, it is evidence of god's loving nature that he sends human messengers for the guidance of humanity right so through his prophets divine eminence uh, is is revealed this kind of closeness that God has to his creation it is through the prophets this is how God reveals his loving nature so the Quran says wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin right i always refer to this as sort of the equivalent of John 3:16 in the Quran this is 21:107 of the Quran which the prophet in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking directly to the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and he says, we did not send you except as a mercy to all the worlds, right? That the prophet, peace be upon him, is the greatest manifestation of God's mercy because the prophet is the greatest messenger of God. He brings us total guidance, guidance for all the world uh, until the end of time. And of course, all the prophets are, uh, are manifestations of God's mercy. I want to use that term, incarnations of God's mercy. Right? Not incarnations of God's person, that's a Christian belief, right? Um, that is intimated at least in the New Testament Gospels, especially the Gospel of John, but that's a Christian belief. So uh, the prophets are, are, are examples of God's mercy in the Islamic tradition. Even Jesus, peace be upon him, in the Quran is also called a mercy. That we will make Jesus a, an, a sign of God, a great sign, and a mercy uh, from us. Right? So we're moving from atheism. And of course, atheism uh, is, is um, a position of belief. So there's a difference between a position of knowledge and a position of belief. Right? There are two positions of knowledge. There's Gnosticism and agnosticism. Right, um, so most atheists, for example, the late Christopher Hitchens, famous atheist, the author of this book, God is Not Great, um, which has been definitively refuted, by the way, by Berlinsky's book, uh, David Berlinsky, which you should get, um, and John Lennox also has an, an extraordinary book, as well. Um, nonetheless, uh, Hitchens always used to refer to himself as an agnostic atheist meaning that, um, that he is going to live his life under the assumption that there is no God, but he doesn't know for sure, he cannot prove that there is no God. So he's an agnostic uh, atheist, right? It's very rare to get a Gnostic atheist. In other words, an atheist who 
who, who knows with certitude that there is no God. And then, of course, you have agnostic believers and, and Gnostic believers as well. So then, that's the first pillar then, right? There's no God but Allah, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a messenger of God. وَتُقِيمُ salah, He says, and to, uh, and to establish the prayer. So this is the second pillar, right? And the prayer, salah, comes from a root word which means to connect. So uh, the prayer is our connection to God. وَتُؤْتِيَ zakah, And to give zakah, to give charity. And the word zakah comes from a word meaning purification. So this is a type of a spiritual purification. وَتَصُومَ Ramadan And to fast the month of Ramadan. Right? One, two, three. This is the fourth pillar. Muslims that are able to will fast the month of Ramadan, the ninth month of the Muslim calendar, as really a commemoration of the Quran, which was, uh, which, whose revelation commenced during the month of Ramadan. وَتَحُجَّ bait and to make pilgrimage in istata'ata ilayhi sabila, if you're able to do so. And that's the final pillar of Islam, to make pilgrimage to Mecca. So this is the Prophet's answer for what is al-Islam, right? And again, in this context, seems to be referring to sort of the exterior aspect of the religion. It is to say upon the tongue, there is no God but Allah, the Prophet is the messenger of God, to establish the prayer, to give the charity, fast the Ramadan and to make Hajj if one is able to do so. And then Qala Sadaqta. Gabriel said, You've answered correctly, or he confirms his answer. And Sayyidina Umar he said, Fa'ajibnalahu yasaluhu wa That was surprising to us that this person is asking the Prophet a question, and then he confirms his answer. Right? And this was, you know, you can call this sort of the Socratic method. Right, where the, the teacher already knows the answer, uh, but the teacher wants to honor the student and have the student um, uh, give the correct answer. Now the second question, tell me about al-iman, and which is oftentimes translated as faith. Right, Iman literally means to cause safety right? Safeguard your soul. It's, it's related to the Hebrew emunah, right? So for example, the famous treatise of Maimonides is called the Sherosha uh, Ashar Iqare Emunah, right? The, the 13 principles of Jewish faith, right? And of course the word amin is related uh, to this as well. So to safeguard your soul, right? So this isn't, you know, you know, blind. Iman doesn't mean that you just believe some, in something blindly. Believe without evidence, you know, uh, belief without evidence. That's not what it is. It means to accept something um, because the evidence points in that direction and by doing so you safeguard your soul in the afterlife. So here in this context so we have Islam, it's being contrasted with Islam. It seems to be referring to sort of the inward aspect or vertical uh, aspect of the religion. Right? So the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said in hadith, which is sound hadith, Al Muslimu man salim al Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadi al qala that the quintessential Muslim, right, submitter is the one that uh, is, is, is he from whose hands and feet, sorry, hands and tongue, hands and feet, hands and tongue, other Muslims remain safe. In other words, uh, the true Muslim is not harming, he's not violent uh, with other Muslims, and he's not slandering and backbiting and being calumnous towards other Muslims. That's the quintessential Muslim. And then the Prophet also said, al-mu'minu, right, the quintessential believer, right, the quintessential believer, Man aminahu nasu ala dima'ihim wa amwalihim, aw kama qala. That the quintessential mu'min, believer, right, the one who internalizes uh, the faith, is uh, the one uh, that humanity, humanity trusts with their literally blood and possessions. 
lives and property, lives and possessions, right? So the sort of field of compassion and love is expanded. It begins with oneself. That's what it means to be selfish. That's what the word idiot means. Idios means self, right? The idiot only cares about himself. And then it expands, obviously, to the family and the community and uh, and then to the Muslims, and then to, to whole, the whole of humanity, right? The whole of humanity. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said in a famous hadith, which is in Bukhari and Muslim, rigorously authenticated, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. أو كما قال that, that uh, none of you truly believe until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself, right? So he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And uh, this, that hadith I just mentioned, is the source of the hadith, as I said, is in Bukhari and Muslim. But Imam an nawawi also included it as hadith number 13, I believe, in his Arba'in, in his famous collection of 40 hadith. And in his commentaries, he uh, defines what does it mean, who is your brother? Right? None of you truly believe until you love, until he loves for his brother. Hatta yuhibba li akhihi. What does that mean? He goes on to say in his commentary, that means your brother, Muslim or Jew or Christian, really your brother in Bani Adam, right? In humanity, right? But he makes that point. And one of my teachers said that there are some manuscripts of uh, Imam Nabawi's um, uh, commentary where that sentence, where, where the Imam says Jews and Christians is taken out uh, of, of his, of his, uh, of, uh, out of his commentary, is apparently um, there are some Muslims who don't want other Muslims to think of Jews and Christians as being their brothers, which is unfortunate. So you have this, this uh, tampering with these, with these commentaries. But that's an authentic saying from the Imam. And that's a sound hadith from the Prophet. So he continues. So what is al-Iman? What is faith, right? What does it mean to safeguard your soul? Qala, the Prophet said, and took me billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wal yawm al-akhir. It is to believe in God, right? Literally to safeguard yourself by means of God. Right? Or we can just say to believe in God. And it's not simply to accept the rational proposition that there is a God. Right? You know, that's, what, that's what Satan did. Satan accepts uh, that there is a God. Right? He accepts that full -hearted, whole, wholeheartedly. Um, but what, what is missing from Satan? Why does the Quran call him a kafir, which means an infidel, if you want? That's a Catholic word unbeliever, a rejecter of faith, is because Satan does not have qabul and id'an, right? He doesn't have acceptance. He doesn't accept the guidance that comes from the prophets. He doesn't have submissiveness or humility towards God, right? Um, one of the books in the New Testament, which is very close to Islamic teaching, is the epistle of James. James, obviously, the successor of, of Jesus, according to Christian history. Uh, he probably didn't write this epistle, but it certainly sounds like something that he, he would have written. Um, seems like someone in his sort of school of thought wrote this epistle, but he says in there that, that even demons believe in God, right? right? So it's, it's not just about what one accepts um, rationally um, or just sort of accepts in oneself but has no uh, has no um, uh, motivation to manifest that faith in action right so faith and action very very important so to believe in God then means not simply to accept things on reason but to but to show one's faith as it were right to perform righteous actions. Believe in God and in his angels and in his books, his scriptures, and in his messengers, and in the last day, the, the day of judgment. Al-Yawm al-Akhir, 
Um, this day of judgment is, has different names in the Quran, Yom Al-Qiyamah, like the day of standing, Yom Al-Din, the day of judgment, Yom Al-Akhir, the final day, the last day, etc. So the Prophet here then gives us these sort of six articles of faith, right? Believe in God, believe in angels, and um, there are four major archangels, Gabriel and Michael, Jibri, Jibril, and then Mikael or Mikael, Israfil, which I believe is Seraphiel in the Bible or in, in Israelite tradition, and then Israel. Israel is not Israel, that's Israel. Israel is uh, also the angel of death, uh, and there are other angels uh, mentioned in the tradition as well. As far as the scriptures go, Muslims believe in four major scriptures and many minor scriptures that are sort of um, uh, indicated as well. But the four major scriptures are the Torah of Moses and the Psalms of David, the Zabur, the Injil, the Gospel given to Jesus, peace be upon him. Is that the same as the Christian Gospel? Or is it the same as the New Testament, the four Gospels, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, the dominant opinion from Muslim scholars is that those books, um, that what, what the Christians are calling the Gospel, is not the pristine Gospel, is not the actual revelation given that Jesus, peace be upon him, although some of the sayings of Jesus could certainly have been preserved in these four books, uh, but that these books, um, they contradict each other, um, uh, and they're written in Greek, which is a foreign language to Jesus. This is sort of the dominant opinion of Muslim scholars. And um, they're written too late, decades later. Of course, there are different ways of looking at these things or counter arguments to those, uh, to those points as well. But this is the dominant opinion. All right? <clears throat> so, for example, um, uh, well, there, there are indications in the Quran that that <clears throat> um, fabrications, textual fabrications, were committed by Christian scribes and Jewish scribes, um, and uh, uh, it seems like there's evidence of this. If you talk to uh, textual critics of the New Testament, for example, there are there are manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark that end at chapter 16, verse 8. Right? And according to eminent uh, textual critics of the New Testament, that's actually the true ending of Mark. The oldest and best Greek manuscripts end at Mark 16, 8. What does it say in Mark 16, 8? Well, it says that on Easter Sunday, uh, a group of women, three women, they go to the tomb or the sepulcher, um, and they find that the stone has been moved away. And there's an angel sitting inside the tomb, and the angel says to the women, you seek Jesus, who has risen. He's gone ahead of you to Nazareth, or to Galilee. Right? And then Mark says, well, whoever wrote this gospel, he doesn't identify himself, but tradition calls him Mark. Uh, Mark says that the women ran away, and they were afraid, and they said nothing to no one. And that's the end of the gospel. Right? So what, at, what happened? It seems like a cliffhanger. Was Jesus actually resurrected? Um, did he survive the crucifixion and flee the city because he's afraid of authorities? Um, what happened? Um, and then uh, a century or so later, a few decades later, lo and behold, you have subsequent manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark where there's now a, uh, a longer ending, as it's called verses 9 through 20, where Jesus actually appears to the disciples, to male disciples, and he commissions them to go into all the world. He tells them that they can handle poisonous snakes and, and drink poison, and no harm would come to them. That's just one example. <clears throat> so Muslims believe in God, and we'll talk, next week we'll talk about, we'll give a little bit of, uh, a, a little lesson on theology, like what do Muslims actually believe about God. Theology, theos and logos, right, means speech about God. What do Muslims say about God? Who is God? Do, do Muslims believe that God is one, uh, a, a sort of um, 
uh, rigid type of Unitarian monotheism? Do gods believe that there's a plurality, if you will, in the quote-unquote Godhead, as Christians do? Uh, do Muslims believe that God has attributes? What are the attributes? We'll go into a little bit of that. Again, we want to keep it uh, very basic. Belief in God, angels, the revelations given to the prophets in their original form, um, and messengers of God, right? Or Rusulihi, according to Muslim tradition, there have been about 124,000 or so prophets although that number is disputed. As I mentioned, 25 of them mentioned explicitly, 25 or so mentioned in the Quran, and belief in the final day. All right, so belief in God, uh, angels, revelations, messengers, day of judgment, وَتُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ And that's the sixth article of faith. Two, three, four, yeah. And that you believe in Qadr. And Qadr, um, is difficult to translate, divine decree, right? Some people sometimes they translate it as destiny. Uh, I like divine decree or divine apportionment. And notice here the prophet, he repeats, and tukmina, that you believe. He repeats that verb um, because uh, qadr is very hard to grasp, right? It's, it's a difficult thing to grasp. Um, that you believe in the, the divine decree, the good and evil of it, right? That everything is from, uh, everything is from God, right? So there's two terms in theology. There's qadar and there's qada. And some of the scholars say that these terms are synonymous. Um, others say that qadar is sort of the measuring out divine apportionment, as we said, God determines all things, uh, and then the qada is the, um, the playing out, if you will, of that, of that uh, divine decree in space-time, uh, in the world, right? So, um, uh, so you had uh, groups in the past that were known as the Jabariya, uh, absolute determinists, who said things like uh, human beings have no free will, um, and so God cannot punish, cannot possibly punish human beings because we have zero volition. Uh, then you have the other extreme, uh, the Qadariya or the absolute libertarians. We're not talking about political libertarianism, which uh, believes that government should not have a lot of intervention, if any, uh, in our lives. No, we're talking about philosophical or theological libertarianism, which espoused that that human beings have absolute free will. Um, they create their own actions. In fact, God doesn't even know uh, the juz'iyat or the, um, um, the particulars of, of, uh, of, uh, of things. He only knows sort of uh, the essences of things. So the truth is somewhere in the middle, as they say. Now, as Muslims, we believe that everything is decreed by God. God has perfect knowledge, right? But at the same time, human beings are held accountable for their choices. Sometimes this is called soft determinism or compatibilism, right? That even though everything is determined by God, even though God knows everything and has the power to do whatever he wants, if an action, uh, is, if an action originated within a person themselves, um, uh, from that person's wants and desires, and there are moral implications to that action, then that person is, is taken to account for that action. Ultimately, it's difficult to understand. Ultimately, it's impossible to understand, right? Um, so that's why the scholars say here that, that the prophet repeats the verb, and took me not that you believe, because this is a difficult thing to believe. And it's difficult to think in terms of um, God's power and knowledge, yet he allows us to do certain things and then takes account uh, for our actions. It's a very difficult um, thing to grasp. Um, but uh, it's, it's sort of like explaining um, you know, calculus to 
a toddler or to like a fifth grader, right? They'll get something, they'll get something from it. They'll, there's a very, very limited understanding, but at the end of the day, the intellect really has to make sajda because it has to make a prostration to God uh, because God's qadr, um, his divine decree is beyond our ability to comprehend, right? Um, if God didn't know what we were going to do, then he wouldn't be God. That's not a solution to anything, right? But this is, um, uh, this is something that we can uh, discuss later as well. So it's, it's, it's akin to what philosophers would call like this, this type of soft determinism, right? That you're still taken to account for your choices, but your choices are indeed limited, right? <clears throat> Okay, so I think it, that's a good place to stop for tonight, inshallah. We'll finish the hadith next time, and then I'll give you a little bit of theology as well, basic theology in the Islamic tradition, uh, and that'll complete next week. Uh, that'll complete our section on, on basic beliefs of Islam, and then we'll move in week three into Judaism, inshallah. Wa sallallahu Muhammadin wa alihi wa sallam, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته